first world order radio final lead final lead we are on the air no doubt all right all right there's always gonna be somebody in the building on first world order radio Get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance, the most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance, the most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know how intention is straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. No doubt, playtime is over. Today we have a special guest. This is Brother Baba Nu. Or Hagan Babanu Hari Mensa Ogun. He's going to be teaching us today basically on the now civilizations and the Western world. Um, so let's get into that information. If you don't know who he is, he's the author of The God Genes Decoded, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And um, I'm pretty sure he's going to have more for you. Um, so we're going to bring on Brother Babanu as well as also uh, my co host, Brother Fahim. Richard and L. Brother Fahim, are you here? Peace, Mo. How you doing? Peace, Mo. How you doing today? Very well. Very well, God. How the God all right, doing? All right. I'm doing well. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you coming on, brother. Yes, sir. No problem at all. All right. Well, we're going to have Brother Babanu come on right now. Uh, let me see if we can get him on here. Brother Babanu, are you here? Yes, I am, Dr. Aline Bay. Thank you for bringing me on this wonderful show. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you coming on, brother. I know um, the audience is going to enjoy this today. We're going to be talking about the civilizations of the Nile Valley and the Western world. So, um, you know, what you have for us today dealing with that information? Uh, yeah, um, you know, I think that it's still a very relevant topic to understand how the civilizations... Is. Pardon me? I said it definitely is. Yeah, yeah. You know, how the civilizations of the Nile Valley laid the foundation of the Western world. And, um, right. you know, we we can see, see that because it was the Romans uh, primarily that, you know, influenced uh, Europe, especially the uh, Brits and Spain, et cetera, and um, other surrounding territories that went on to set up architecturally and then manifest uh, uh, as the Western world. And the Romans were a continuation of the Greeks, and it was the Greeks that borrowed heavily from from ancient Egypt. Now, you know, some people even claim, I'm not exactly certain about this, but it sounds right, that it was a Nisut, a.k.a. Pharaoh, who uh, founded Athens, uh, and his name was Senorset. And then right. that went on to 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 become what we know as our classical Greek civilization. Now, 
the deity Athena is the Kamor uh, deity Meath, who is the patron deity of high priests and priestesses. So, you know, it's very, 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 uh, you know, interesting, that connection. Um, well, you know. It's also saying that um, 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 Thoracis, um, had Heshep Soot um, spread those teachings, you know, um, you know, of Neek, you know, throughout the Western world, and that also became part of the mystery school system. And with wow, that influence, I'm, I'm, the yeah. world too. So, yes, you definitely on point, brother. That was a good thank you very, thank you very much. Um, you know, I want to get in, 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 into what made the civilizations of the Nile Valley great, especially as you got you know further north into further north of Africa or from the center. You know, it would be considered south because of the way that the Nile flows, but um, you know, it was the Nile. And the climate that made Kemet so great, it was a very, it is an opportune uh, uh, place. The Nile has two major tributaries, the White Nile and the Blue Nile. The White Nile is longer and rises in the Great Lakes region of Central Africa, with the most distant source still undetermined but located in either Rwanda or Burundi. It flows north through Tanzania, Lake Victoria, Uganda, and South Sudan. The Blue Nile is the source of most of the water and fertile soil. It begins at Lake Tana in Ethiopia and flows into Sudan from the southeast. The two rivers meet near the Sudanese capital of Khartoum. The mm-hmm. Nile provided these classical civilizations of Africa with the water, fertile soil, and transport lands they needed to flourish. The ancient Egyptians, Nubians, and Cushites, etc., were able to farm beyond their needs and store food for safety. They engineered aqueducts and canals to move resources to many parts of their civilization. The Nile is like the first superhighway for human civilization. Once the people can stabilize their food supply, it is much easier to focus on the task of civilization building. And this is what now provided the people of these early civilizations. Farming and navigating on now forces the people to keep track of the movements of the celestial bodies, and they're able to create a calendar, which also leads to tracking other events that harmonize with the movements of the celestial bodies. Thus, astronomy was the logical development of these people. Uh, you know, I, I really want to talk about climate because, you know, nowadays we hear about holy land, holy land, holy land. Um, um, there were periods when the area known as Kemet was lush forest and marsh areas. At these times, civilization like we see in Kemet wasn't built there. Excessive rain, which you find in tropical forest areas, is not ideal for glorious culture. It seriously impacts outdoor activities. We have to realize that the ancient people of the Nile Valley pioneered outdoor activities because it did not rain much, and they did not need rain as much or at all because the Nile provided all their water needs for drinking, cleaning, and irrigation of our crops. So, you know, we're looking at a civilization, uh, it is in desert, it is dry, it is sunny, and a person might think, oh, it's desert, you can't, you know, grow things there. But, you know, um, with with the Blue Nile, which fertilized the soil well, and which also, right, which, which, which fertilized the uh, soil, they had all of the nutritional needs that plants and crops can grow and flourish very, very well. So, you know, not just the water, but the fertilization satisfied their need for, uh, you know, food. Um, With now the uh, climate, which is something I want to get into, I know that most of us pretty much understand how the climate of the tropics or that tropical belt is ideal for the evolution of life and the evolution of culture. When you move up north and it's cold, it has four seasons, you know, you you, you have a smaller window of time to uh, plant. Um, so let's get into what the ancient 
Egyptians did with this ideal situation as it relates to what we see here in the Western world as culture. I mean, they were the forerunners of this, and the people who went on to set up the Western world, their, their ancestors saw this in ancient Kemet. They pioneered sports, games like baseball. Yes, baseball comes from Egypt. The Western world got the idea of baseball from the ancient Egyptians. And it's interesting because I don't find baseball to be the best sport. And I always used to wonder why is baseball America's pastime? Why why isn't it football? Why isn't it basketball? I mean, people like these sports better. Well, the reason is is that this civilization very much so in certain regards, it's a copy of ancient Kemet. So they played baseball in, in, in ancient Kemet. Um, another thing that we that is popular here is the game of chess. Now, if you do your research, the, the game of chess is derived from the game of Senate. Uh, Senate is a game that, you know, kings and queens would uh, play. This became the the uh, game chess. Yachting. Several yachts have been found in ancient Kemet. Yachting is seen as a sport and pastime of the elites because the culture of Kemet itself has been adopted by the ruling elites of the Western world. Now we come to rowing. Some of us are familiar with the rowing teams we see at Ivy League universities. Well, this comes from ancient Kemet. Uh, landscaping, very, very important because I've met black people that are just so great at landscaping. And I had to say, I don't think that you, you just started doing this. You know, uh, things like gardening with ponds, fountains, and even uh, planting certain trees and bringing exotic animals the ancient Kamo would do. Now, getting closer to, you know, what, we as, you know, conscious pe people like about cultures, universities with student bodies numbering almost 90,000. Ancient Kemet has several university complexes with a student body and staff that numbered around 90,000. These were like cities. Um, the universities were temple complexes that were very, very wealthy. You know, this is similar to a university that has an endowment. So, you know, when when you look at a civilization that has universities, obviously it, it has a system of writing, you know, um it has a system of creating books, you know, um you also have uh our school. Some people had to pay for school, uh some people got scholarships. So from, you know, two, three, four about 4,000 B.C. at least, before the Western world and Europe was civilized and stuff like that, you had Africans in this region going to school, wearing school uniform, uh, getting on rowing teams, and learning how to handle a yacht so they could have these sports with yachts. Um, music. You had orchestras with several different instruments. You had theater. Um, it is even said that what we call the call the liberal arts as something that you study in school was a part of the uh, curriculum at these universities. Now, you know, we haven't even gotten into the government. This is like the foundation of civilization itself. For me, it's almost 100% adapted in style and form from ancient Kemet. Uh, the architecture and style of buildings, uh, you know, this was this was adapted from ancient Kemet. The idea of having a White House. Now, in ancient Kemet, the White House was called the Pra, which became the word Pharaoh, meaning that the monarchy uh, king or queen wasn't called a Pharaoh. They were called a nesut, uh, or which is where in Israel they get the idea of a nest. It's called ka, ka neset. Uh in Israel, Knesset or Neset. Um, you know they adopted this or co-opted it from the ancient Kemal, whereby now instead of the 
uh, it being called a para'ah, which became the word pharaoh, the actual name for king, which is Nisut or Neset, becomes the name of the place where you find the monarchy or government or leadership central. Now, uh, the main para in Kemet was situated at what they call Ankh Tawi because it was meant to um, it was meant to anchor the land and to maintain a unity between north and south. Um and you know, we are talking about Kemet that was pi- that was pioneered and unified by Narmor. And it's very, very important to understand this man's name. You know, some people say Narmur, but you know, for me it's Narmor meaning that, you know, he was a Moor. And, um, you know, this is something that Moors are very, very, very good at, nation building, unification, and allowing people of, quote, unquote, different faith, et cetera, different levels of evolution to be able to unify under one nation state. And being that we also have learned that, you know, uh, through people like Matthew and Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, that the world's major religions have their roots and origins and origins in ancient Kemet, you know, I'm not in harmony with the Egyptologists stating that there was this, like, you know, religious war going on between different temples and stuff like that. The story is far more complex and sounds actually better when you get into it. But they had a unity. Um, there were three major, what they call, cult centers in ancient Kemet. Uh, there was the cult center or educational center at Anu, where you find the cosmology at, at at Anu, and this is the root of Christianity. There was a cult center at Menefer, which became the word Memphis. And this is where you find the root and origins of Judaism. And there was a cult center or educational center at Kemenu. And uh, this is where you find the origins and root of, you know, what people call Islam. And the colors, respectively, were red, white, and blue, which is what you find on the American flag. And, uh, you know, people have been, you know, thankfully showing that the origins of the American flag, even with the stars, the stripes, and the bars, that flag was in Kemet and in use. And I, as you know, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. So you know, they have taken the flag, uh, they have taken the the uh, culture, and they have adopted it primarily for for the leadership and rulership of the Western world. You know, how many of us get to do yachting and rowing, you know, how many of us are, you know, at the orchestra or in theater and these other things, you know, in ancient Kemet, they have fashion shows as well, you know, people would design clothing and have fashion shows as like pageantry, they would do fashion in harmony with different deities, what color they represent and style, and this is where the idea of pageantry comes from which is akin to the word pagan, meaning that the word pagan is about so-called polytheism and how the deities of a people's pantheon process uh, in a processional with style and regalia and these types of things. This is what we are calling fashion shows now. And, you know, I was listening to, uh, you know, Kanye West ranting about the fashion world and basically what he was saying is, you know, it is elitist and it's hard for, you know, brothers to break into. So, you know, especially those industries, it's very hard for, for us to, to really break into. These were, this was our culture. This is, you know, what a lot of us uh, throughout the years have been accustomed to doing. And, you know, uh, Kemet, uh, starting with Namor, you can say that is a restart, you know, the uh, act of building civilization and having these cultural institutions is something that a lot of us have been accustomed to as human beings on the planet upwards of uh, 75,000 years, meaning that the ancient Kamo state that they had been keeping track of the great year three times, and the great year is 25,920 years. This is how long it takes for the sun 
to process through every single sign of the zodiac. And being that they were keeping track of the movements of the stars for navigation and farming and to also organize civilization and culture in very, very innovative ways, you know, um, they had also kept track of the history and they stated that they had done this three times, you know, since what we know as that now Valley style of civilization is is, is around 75,000 years old. And I've had people who are very, very high in the Masonic order, says that, you know, white Masons brought and showed them documents that showed that black people, African people, dark-skinned people, melanated people, whatever you want to call them, have been around for about 75,000 years. And what they mean by being around, they mean being around with writing, you know, math, um, Mm -hmm. fashion, jewelry, you know, uh, music, uh, architecture, building you know, navigating and these types of things, not that we were around trying to move from a so-called primitive state to a more advanced state. We had already pretty much transitioned into an advanced state of civilization 75,000 years ago. And when you see how well and easy it is for us as a people to be great at performing arts, you know, dancing, singing, playing instruments, theater, acting, and these types of things, you know, jewelry making, costume design and style, you know, poetry, these type of things, it's because it's a part of our collective history for such a long period of time, you know. Um, So these are some of the major things that, you know, uh, when pe- when we look at the Western world and we are in this search for who we are and what we are and what we are about, not to throw the baby with the bath water, because what has happened is that the culture of the elites, that was the culture of our ancestry. And, you know, there is a saying. They say that 80% of Caucasian people live above the poverty line whilst 80% of black people live below the poverty line. Well, if you take a civilization like Kemet and you had 80% of the population living above the poverty line, then you have a very large percentage of the population engaging in, you know, school, education, arts, you know, theater, uh, architecture, these type of things. So this meaning... For a, for lack of a better term, this is our culture. As opposed to seeing it as, oh, that's what Europeans do, or that's what white people do. Uh, not not so. You know, they got it from us. We don't see ourselves in it. Uh, we barely get to, to participate in it. So, you know, we might have an issue in terms of looking at it as well as not being represented even at least in the media as being, you know, progenitors of it as well. Yeah, that, that, that comes from not, uh, them not studying uh, our history and culture like they should. So they say that uh, it, it, trying to be like Europeans, uh, whatever, Caucasians or whatever, you know, and that's a lack of, you know, it was, it's just a lack of knowledge. Right and, and yes, and, and ignorance on their part, and when they say right. things like that, yeah, which is why you know when we look at the state of our people today, you know I chose this message because I I think it's very very important. You know you have some of us who are looking for that lifestyle, quote unquote. You don't want to feel guilty. If anything, you should feel guilty about not wanting to share and give back. And, you know, there are a lot of us who have uh, risen financially in this culture whereby they can not just be a voice, but they can participate, you know, in these things. The The main thing that you should have a problem with or feel guilty about is not trying to uplift more of your brothers and sisters with the wealth that you have attained because there is a disparity, you know. Um, Another very, very important thing that was pioneered by the 
ancients of the Nile Valley is medicine, and not just medicine. When you look at Ebers papyrus and you look at the type of medical in- instruments that they used in ancient Kemet, even now they'll show you much of much hasn't changed. You know, much hasn't changed. Uh, you can call it a hospital. You can call it a, a clinic. You know, ancient Kemet had these things. You know, if a person lost their toe and they could afford it, they would have a prosthetic made. You know, yeah. uh, things happen in life. But the fact that they were making prosthetic limbs, you know, uh, for well o- over, you know, 3,000 years ago or four 4,000 years ago, meaning less Let's be kind of modest and say 2000 BC, and it's now 2014 AD. This is like over you know 4,000 years ago. People were being given prosthetic limbs. Uh, very, they were making surgical devices for brain surgery with the type of precision that is only matched in the industrialization of machinery and, and these types of things. So. You know, you have a uh, people that were more than on the forefront and cutting edge of what makes a civilization. You know, when you can say you have a civilization, and what made it really, really great was not just these institutions and you know infrastructure, you know, roads uh, and these type type of things, but the moral output of the people was very, very famous by surrounding civilizations. You know, uh, people who were recording history, especially in Greece, uh, you know, they always attested to how moral these people were, you know. Um, uh, Another thing about ancient Kemet, which is so popular in the Western world, is tourism. Kemet was a major tourist spot. People from other civilizations took vacations in Kemet. They went there as well. They wanted to party with the ancient Egyptians. In ancient Kemet, you know, this is, especially people from the islands, this is going to sound very familiar. In ancient Kemet, being able to host and throw a party was so important that your stature in the neighborhood was tied into your ability to host a great party. And they were so good at hosting parties because they were so good at enjoying life. People from other civilizations wanted to visit there to go to a party and have fun with these people. And this is still the case with black people today. If you really want to enjoy yourself and have a whole lot of fun, you know you need some black people in there. And it's because it's something that we've been doing. Uh, and this brings me to the now, because the now was called happy. The The idea of happiness itself and being happy was attributed to the people of the now Valley, meaning that the Western world took the name of a deity that ran through that civilization called happy, and it became the idea of happiness mm. itself. So you you are talking about a very, very happy people. You know, it's very, very important for people to understand that they enjoyed life in this civilization. You know, there were issues. It wasn't perfect. You know, they were warring nations. But within those borders, you know, these, people's, these people live a happy life. I've seen... I've seen images of people having a romantic dinner on a boat that was sailing down the Nile. Exactly. Yes, that was the nature of uh, of the African or uh, African Moors, uh, whatever we want to call them. That was the nature of our people. And uh, this is a lot of things that the European, as you said a little earlier, had taken away from us, the happiness and the spirituality of our people. And uh, this is what the, the science, the high culture science, uh, uh, the reason why our people, most of our, like you say, 80% of our people were living above the poverty level. And this is what the Europeans saw. 
and this what he saw would be essential to his culture, to Europe, to the people of Europe, because the Europe, people of Europe were still living in caves. They didn't even take baths. So uh, even bathing, uh, uh, they got from us, you know, and so on. And so on and so forth. Um, you know, when you think, you know, just giving a figure like a rough one, like 80% of the people living above the poverty line, and you superimpose that on a civilization like Kemet, which didn't have a food shortage problem, uh, which was able to procure, you know, gold, uh, timber from the central region of Africa, spices, oils, incenses, and these types of things, they would have these huge barges going down the Nile, down to Central Africa, and they would be, you know, trading with these things and bring it back to enrich the civilization. You you now have uh, a large percentage of the population, you know, living in housing that was palatial. You know, a lot of people lived on what we would call an estate. So you had, it might be a house or a few houses on the land, and then you might have a few other structures on the land that you and your family lived on. Um, and, and, you know, why this is so important is because when you look at Rome, you know, mm-hmm. Rome, Rome started to entice and force a lot of people to live in the cities. The average person in Rome could only afford to rent a room. It's interesting that room and Rome sound so similar. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the, there is a documentary on this. You can YouTube, thank you. You you can Google uh, Rome. I think it's by the History Channel, Ancient Rome. And they'll show you this documentary that the average person in Rome could only afford a room. Hmm. Uh, this is what is happening to a lot of people in the major city centers in America right now. These rooms had no place to cook and no place to bathe. So the average person in Rome was also eating takeout food. And the takeout food obviously wasn't the best food. So, you know, fast food diet and fast food life, that is not new to these people and their culture. They have done it before, and that's what they're doing again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in in Rome, if you could afford to eat well and work out at a gym, that alone gave you status because so many people were unhealthy, meaning that a person with some muscles, with some muscles and clean clothing, could get a whole lot of the good am- amenities of life because they just stuck out from every from most of the rest of the population. They looked more similar to the rulers. So, you know, and you know, people ate a lot of um you know, uh chick chickpeas and bread. Meaning on a daily basis you didn't even get much meat. Uh you, you didn't get much good good, you know, grains and vegetables and salads and fruits and stuff like that. It was chickpeas and bread. That was one of the major, uh, you know, foods that 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 were sold as fast food. You know, so this food is prepared. Is just sitting there. You you know, walk up to a shop and you order a meal of chickpeas and bread, and you you went home to your room, just one room with all of your possessions. They said in Rome you had status if you had a place that had like three or four rooms. You know, so you had a living area, you had a cooking area, and then you might have like a den or some something like that. You know, you were upper class if you had this, whereas, you know, uh, a small amount of the population was upper class. So, you know, going back to Kemet, you know, uh, meaning that they, when they, were building up their civilizations and coming up on the scene in, you know, Rome, because, you know, Rome Rome has so much influence. It had big, big, uh, it, it had big armies. 
you know, uh, mm-hmm. they fought the Punic Wars. It became yeah. the Roman Catholic Church with the Council of Nicaea and the Crusades. And, you know, I mean, Rome Rome did a lot. So it's something that you just can't leave out when, when you're looking at where we are at today uh, in many, many parts of the you know world. You know, Rome had, had a lot of influence in laying down the foundations of the mess that we find ourselves in. Now, when you look at the mess that Rome itself was in, it it should make more sense why we are in this mess and how this pattern of civilization that seems to um, ignore the needs of the general population in favor of making money, building armies, going to war, plundering uh, to maintain status and stature is the type of civilization that, you know, Rome pretty much pioneered. Mm -hmm. And this is happening again, as opposed to what, you know, we find in places like Kemet and Nubia and Tamerovi and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, Yeah, uh, Rome, like you said, still has a big influence uh, on uh, the world, especially the Western world. And uh, I hate to say Africa, too, as well. Yeah. Uh, the Roman English, economic laws and, uh, you know, everything, you know. And I'm, I'm really, I, I, this is my first time in hearing Rome and Rome, how you uh, uh, broke down the science on where the, actually where the word room come from. It's Rome, you know, they both are synonymous. Uh, uh, define room for living space. And uh, uh, the diet, the way to, uh, the food that we eat, even today, you have McDonald's, uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, 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 things of that uh, nature. That, that a lot of this, not even real chicken, most people don't know. Nice. And the food that you eat, the diet that you eat, is not the same as the ones our ancient forefathers and mothers ate in the, in the motherland, you know, and also here in the ancient Americas as well. And, uh, that's yeah. why we have so much sicknesses and diseases exactly. and illnesses that we have that keep the medical profession rich. You know. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, in Rome, a lot of people were very, very ill. The uh, lifespan was very, very short. You know, um, you know people didn't live a, a good life. You know, they ended up uh, to to uh, keep the people distracted, as a, like you know, they couldn't use a sport like baseball to keep the people dis distracted. They brought out the gladiators. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, where people would go and see you know murder and mayhem. Yes. Yeah. Because the less culture and cultural wealth you can give to people the more distraction you give them with blood and gore. Mm. Blood, blood, yeah. Mm. Blood and gore, yeah. You know, blood and gore, life and death has the ability to captivate the human soul and mind so much that it becomes now a substitute for a good life. Having right. a family, ha- you know, having children, having good food. You know, um, you know, praying. Yeah, praying together, meditating to together, as well as you know, pastimes like you know, let's go down to the lake and rent a boat for the day and go on the Nile. You know, these type of things. When people don't have these things to keep the population in line, you know, they would bring them to these 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 arenas. Give them a lot of free bread, so you knew that when you got there, you you were gonna get something to eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, and 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 then totally transfix you pro- probably for two or three hours with different pe- with different pe- people trying to kill each other, and you know people died, people got slashed, people bled, you know. Um, you know, they would, you know, as Rome expanded and conquered foreign lands, they would look mm-hmm. for the best fighters, take them prisoner, and, you know, basically here, here, here is a sword or an axe or whatnot, fight for your life. 
if you live, you get to be famous. And, you know, if if you don't, my crowd gets to be satisfied. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, this is what people have in an exchange for culture. And, you know, this is still being done to this day with the theater and the movies. You know, it is the action films or it is the horror film genre that brings in the most money. That's right. You know, that, that yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we are looking at when... When when we have civilization, the type of things that we do as a people, what takes what takes precedent? Um, they said in ancient Kemet, there there were more temples to the goddess Sekhmet than to any other deity. Now they're calling them temples, yes, but these were clinics, and it was in these clinics that people would be given herbs like. Tabernanta iboga, Syrian rue, you mm. know, herbs like ayahuasca for their healing. Uh, so they made sure that the people had an access to proper medical care. We are in 2014, and one of the biggest fights going on right now is over people having access to medical care. I'm not even going to say proper medical care, but medical care, period. That's something. In this day and age As, now. Yeah, in in this day and age is that someone can argue whether or not a civilization that has the type of resources, meaning that uh, even when the market crashed, they said that American corporations have never been this rich in the history of America. In the history of America, American corporations have never had this amount of money. Mm-hmm. So the recession is one that's being engineered and managed against the population as opposed to even the natural bust and bust, uh, bust and boom cycles that they have to create to manage their economy. Exactly. The, exactly. You can, yeah, yeah you, you, know, you can provide people with medical care. Uh, it, it's not going to bankrupt the country. Um, you know, it's not going to pull down the country's credit score. You know, these type of things. But this shows you where the heart of the leadership is. Yes. You know, um, I, I, you know, spoke to someone who had, let's just say, connected with the ruling elites. Yeah, and this uh, person was stuck on one statement. They don't care about anybody. They don't care about anybody. You know, I want to hear something else. You know, oh, they don't care about anybody. They don't care about anybody. Just kept saying this over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. But this was also his way of saying he doesn't care about anybody because the people who have made him rich don't, yeah, don't care about anybody. Right. And, no, and right. you know, yeah, because... A lot of people, when they, I call it being, I call it sellout, when they are allowed to eat at the trough of wealth in Western culture, it comes with a contract. You can't help the poor people out. And, you know, I was listening to the music that, you know, was being played, the hip-hop, and it talked about, you know, economic hitmen. And the job of an economic hitman is to ensure that who becomes, who leads that so-called third world country does not help the poor people to develop. You know, this all. is totally anathema to the style of civilizations that we build. When we are allowed to build civilization the purpose of the leadership and the government is to serve the common man and woman. Exactly. You know, more than just, quote, unquote, serving the common good, you serve the common good through service to the common man and woman. And when you do this, you don't have to, uh, um, you know, oppress people and force them into this and that, they naturally cooperate. 
you know, this is why when the Visigoths started being a trouble up in Europe, the U- the Caucasians called for the Moors. They say, please come and help us. Please take over. We want you to rule. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when we rule, we establish morality. Mm-hmm. You know, Moors establish morality when they rule, and that has to do with caring for the people. And this care for the people is more than just food as nourishment for their physical body, but culture as nourishment for their soul. Mm-hmm. It is criminal to deny a person good music. It is yes, criminal it is. to deny a person decent looking and smelling clothing. And it is criminal to deny a person access to medicine. Yes. Because the uh Western most of the world the world and period is ran by by criminally uh people that are criminally insane and, and twisted like minded people. And this is this the uh these are the kind of people that are in leadership and, and the control of your uh, uh, big uh, 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 banking industries, uh, corporations, and they you know they decide who be president and who don't. You know, <coughs> and they you know they uh, control the food industry, the medical industry, and uh, the, the the educational in, uh, uh, institutions, even your prison institutions, which they are making a mint of money off of, or so-called money, I should say. <laughs> Off of these prisons in your prisons all over the world, and has gained a lot of profit, like wars, uh, uh, you name it. Right, you, yeah. you, you know, um, you know, there's a saying, uh, you know, don't don't judge less you be judged. I'm I'm really not of that leaning. Right. Uh, it's a person's natural inclination to analyze or form. And opinion of what they are seeing, um, you know. But it's it's that when you are informed, you know, when you can calculate and analyze, is when you know you can make a better judgment. And you know, let's say I and some other people owned a country, and we went to war, we captured people, or you know, we robbed them, we took the resources, blah 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 blah. When mm-hmm. when when we get back home, we are gonna try our best to help every single person of the civilization that we own and control to have a better life. So when you say they are criminally insane, this is what it means to be criminally insane. Mm-hmm. To brutalize, rape, and murder foreign people to get a lot of resources and then brutalize, rape, and murder your own people, yeah. your people in your own in your, in your own borders. Mm-hmm. You know, because it shows that you really don't care about anybody. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but themselves, you know, they care about uh, what, how much more they can get and grab from the people, you know, as the people grow poor and uh, they're growing richer and more rich and powerful. That's that's, that's all they care about, yeah. bottom line. So, you know, um, by, by, by adopting a lot of the infrastructural genius of a civilization like Kemet, is one of the ways in which they buy participation in a system that's not moral. And, you know, for me, you know, making a stand against this despotism means showing and explaining how the perversion manifest because you know you are buying people's allegiance with something that's very wholesome something that is very beautiful but you're mm-hmm. buying people's allegiance into something uh on a grand scale and in general that is unhealthy and immoral 
and the ways in which we allow our cooperation to be bought and sold, um, you know, is something that we as the general population have to accept a level of responsibility for. No doubt. You know, as a yeah, as opposed to just saying, well, you know, this this is not correct or you know, I mean, it is worse. Uh, people's silence is absolutely worse, you know, and it, you know, you see, uh, I, I can recall the Occupy Wall Street movement. The reason why I considered it a farce is because uh, the last two years of the Bush presidency, the economy had pretty much bottomed out. But mm-hmm. you didn't see an Occupy Wall Street movement funded by a billionaire called George Soros. Mm-hmm. You wait till you have a black man in the White House to fund such an event when it happened during the Bush years. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is, for a long time, we are not seeing a black family, a black man, or black woman in a position of leadership of a powerful nation, and then you have other powerful people in the nation funding uh, movements that embarrass the office of the president. So, you know, while I agree that Wall Street needs to be occupied, what we find here in the West is a continuing perversion of, well, let me do it when there's a Negro in the White House. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, as opposed to doing it when the primary person responsible for the economic collapse is in the White House. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's divided like that, divided like that, so it can make uh, uh, maybe Obama look bad. Designed to make him look bad, and right. you know, all that time when Bush was in office, you know. Okay, uh, we ain't not gonna do that. We gonna do that. We gonna wait till Obama's in office. They know he's gonna be in office. They, they know who's gonna be president beforehand already. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's all by design, you know. To and, and then the people, they listen to that job, you know. Uh, I had one more talking about Obama hasn't done anything since he's been in office. Uh, since he's been in office, you know, he hasn't done. I have. I try to get him to understand. I said, you got to realize that the corporate, big corporate banking industrialists have put him in office. So, therefore, he has to do their bidding for them. Right. You know, and, and you know, uh, you have, to, you have to, to realize presidents don't really run the country. Exactly. You know, um, you know George, George George Bush had a lot of influence as a president because he, his dad ran 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 the Pentagon, the CIA, which meaning which means that they they had control over the army. When you have control over the military apparatus of a country like the U.S., then you have influence. Obama, you know, doesn't have that level of control and access to uh, power, you know. Still, still, you know, he is trying very, very hard. He's very, very innovative, but per, but pretty much is business as usual. Well, yeah. in some regards, because, you know, I read an article in the Huffington Post, and what this article said it was that Corporations have been found guilty of hoarding money because there's a black president. Let me repeat. Hmm. Huffington Post article said corporations have been found guilty of hoarding money because there's a black president, meaning hmm. that the recession is being kept up. The way that corporations are acting towards the population in terms of, you know, uh People having less jobs, people getting less loans, you know, people getting less things to increase cash flow so the industry would flourish is because there's a black president, meaning they don't want a black man to be in office when there's a boom. And if you study the bus boom cycle, we are supposed to be in the period of an economic boom. Mm-hmm. This thing happens like clockwork. Well, 
is the clock broken? The clock isn't broken. They, they just don't want Obama to go down in history as a president that presided over a nation where prosperity was flourishing closer down the ladder. Pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. You know, so, you know, when we look at the origins of, of, of the style of civilization of the Western world, you know, uh, what what is supposed to be ideal and a goal, and we look at how things are, we know the moral capacity of these people. Their moral capacity is very, very low. You yeah. could have a whole lot of so-called knowledge and insight, but you can really tell where a person is when they have the opportunity to do something. And I'm saying it's because, you know, at the bottom of civilization, we always judge each other this, that, yay, nay, et cetera. But a lot of us really don't have the opportunity to do anything better. Is when a person is given the opportunity, you have a huge team, you have a lot of power, you have a lot of resources, you know, the the ability to distribute them. You know, you have a lot, a lot of knowledge and insight because you inherited it from people who had mastered the art of civilization. If you do not implement these things, that's how we can read your moral compass, and it's very low. So, you know, I always say when a country has an issue, the leadership bears the brunt of the responsibility. Yeah. The population in general, we ask them to be accountable because it's very difficult to get the leadership to change, you know, and the onus now falls on the population because if you if you have power, if you have mansions, pools, yachts, jet planes, and all this type of stuff, and you have no interest in making things better, then you have to turn to the population and try to inspire them to be as good as they can collect and unify to make things better for themselves. You can't depend on the leadership, but the leadership is where the primary responsibility and blame goes for the state of the nation. Yeah, yeah. that's because the leadership of, 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 I can say, of all countries has been compromised. So, uh, like I said before, uh, and, and, and again, uh, uh, we in a time of, of rulership ourselves, you know, as people uh, all over the world. But the biggest, the big, big, big problem is uh, 75 to 80 percent of us are not ready. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the that, number one that, problem. Yeah, you know, um, in studying the so-called revolutionary movement, you know, especially here in North America, um, cal- calculating the, the the series of events that started from 1492 and the domino effect of this is not easy to find you know, black people, dark-skinned people, melanated people, indigenous and original people who are ready and prepared for for leadership, especially because they don't get to role-play and participate in the whole, you know, act and paradigm of leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, school is supposed to prepare you for leadership, but... When we study, um, you know, people like Orwell, we know that a primary thrust of the educational system is to reduce people's mental capacity. When we look at things like food as a weapon, we know that Mm -hmm. food is being used to make it difficult for people to even concentrate and behave themselves in school. So at the one hand, you have an educational system that, you know, makes it difficult for people to really analyze and compute because education is supposed to increase the the, the, the brand's aptitude for analyzing and computing data and information. 
You know, um, thinking equationally is a sign of intelligence, understanding the variables and the consonants in the statements and information and knowledge that you are using to express yourself to you are using a form and opinion, you know, is how you get balanced. This is something pioneered by the goddess Ma- Ma'at, which is where the word math comes from, you know. Um, this, is, this is not something that, that especially the lower rungs of the population get to experience in uh, school. You know, uh, usually you have to homeschool or you have to get your child into some type of, you know, uh, boarding school or into a neighborhood that is more affluent and that is lighter. It's straight to here. Or or you you have to get your kids, you know, kids in a school like in the Caribbean, you know, mm-hmm. um, parts of Africa or China. Else, you know, that type of aptitude uh, it doesn't get developed. When I came to this country, I was watching a commercial for something called Hooked on Phonics. And this is a commercial. It's something that you have to buy. It's supposed to help your kids to read really, really well uh, quickly. Well, hook, hook, Hooked on Phonics, that's how we learn to read in school. You know, in Barbados, it's not something that you have to go buy and purchase. You know, meaning that this is how all the schools teach people how to mm. read. Mm what they call hooked on phonics here, it becomes commercialized, you know? Mm. Uh, access to intelligence and wealth and training comes at a high price in America. So, mm. you know, th- this is, you know, when we, when, if you hear, hear me ever talking about the beast of capitalism, capitalism is a demon. You know, oh, yeah. Capitalism is a demon that is devouring the souls of man and woman, you know? Yeah. Um, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know it's a beast that's worthy of being slayed and destroyed and buried. You know, um, you can sum up a lot of people's issues to capitalism itself. Yeah, you know, when you add some something like white supremacy to capitalism, you <laughs> you 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 have a system now uh, that is very much like the caste system of India. And if you look at the caste system of India, which has been been around for quite some time, you know, you see that the darker you get, the poorer you get, the worse your neighborhood gets. Mm. The lighter you get, the better your education gets, the better your neighborhood gets, the better your status in society gets. So if you if you don't get rid of white supremacy and capitalism uh, you can have all types of movements, uh, riots, uh, sit-ins, walk-ins, and meetings, and nothing will change. No. No. It, 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 even those are controlled. Your sit-ins or your marches are controlled as well because they have to pay for them to do that. Because they... <laughs> so it's, uh, it's against it. Uh, 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 you have to pay the same people that you are marching and sitting in against. And and this is the, the, the really deceptive, cleverly deceptive uh, over our people. And they still can't see it today. And a lot of our so-called, uh, so-called leaders, what I call them, uh, 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 leaders, I call them uh, leaderless people, that leading our people, misleading our people, misleading our people into believing that, that this will do them some good. March, protest, you know, but then, but they're not telling them that they have to pay for these protests, and marches, and sit-ins. You know, it's ironic. And yeah, and it simply becomes another industry. You know, NGOs and nonprofits are industries now. Now, so you, you, you know what we are looking at now is this is what they didn't get from us. You know, what they got from us was, you know, having schools, having hospitals, astronomy, keeping track of the stars, uh, you know, architecture, you know, building style, you know, um, you know, having a government, uh, you know, having a religion or a culture, you know, whatnot. You know, these these are the things that, you know, they, you know, picked 
from us what kind kind of tools you need for surgery, things like prosthetics, um, you know, leisure, as in hobbies like, you know, yachting and, you know, baseball. You know, the, this is what they got from us. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they what they didn't take, what they didn't keep, you know, what it seems like they weren't interested in is, you know, what holds together the a healthy social fabric. You know, I think that they saw what does and they realized if we can pervert this, it's much easier to control the population and make it difficult for the leadership to be to be usurped. And I have a theory. If a person really isn't capable for leadership, then it behooves that person to reduce the health, which is, you know, comes into people having robust physical bodies. They can fight, you know, they can work hard at improving their their life. And intelligence, aptitude, training in the arts, which really helps to increase the aptitude of your mind and the way that it works. If you If you can pervert those things, then it's much easier to control a population that you yourself don't have the moral capacity, the internal moral fiber to govern. Right. And now yeah. this, yeah, this starts to make sense now in the ways that you see the rich behaving. You know, cold and callous. You know, leaders truly, you know, leadership, the Yi Ching says to, to truly lead is to serve. Right. And, you know, I I think that whoever wrote that knew the vices of man and woman. Because mm-hmm. a person would might think that to truly lead is to lead. <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, just just be in the forefront, giving direction, et cetera, et cetera. But to truly lead is to serve. You know, um, in, in ancient Kemet, uh, you had a uh, you know priesthood that was called a hemnetir, which means servant of the the netaru, and you also had you know netarhenu, which means servant of the netaru. And they said even a person on the highest level of priesthood was still called Netarhenu because you're still a servant. Okay. You know, and, 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 you know, your your job is to serve the people through getting the proper guidance and orientation and assistance of the Netaru. You know, what they help you to understand and develop and innovate that is for you to bestow upon the public, upon exactly. the people. You know, it's not for your own personal individual gain. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yes. Uh, as I always say to the people that wants to know anything about uh, history, uh, African history, more science, I say, well, how can I help you? How, how can I be a service to you? You know, I am your servant, you know, and that's what what we are supposed to be. Uh, you're exactly right on that point. Wow. Um, is there any questions or any points that the host or any guest would like to know? Yeah. If there's any questions, yeah, I always ask uh, people. Uh, some people, I had a nephew of mine asking me, uh, uh, somebody came to him about the Illuminati, and it kind of spooked him out. And I had explained to him, I had to talk, I have a long talk on them, and and tell about some some of it, some of it is true, some of it's pure nonsense. Right. And you have to the uh, uh, tell the difference between the BS and the truth. You know, uh, he's trying to tell me. Uh, uh, well, you know, do you know the rapper uh, Little Wayne? He's a Illuminati. I said, no, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> you know, I said a lot of this, a lot of these put out uh, scare tactics that put fear into the people, but they.
they never these type of uh, uh, DVDs or uh, uh, documentations or documentaries or whatever never tell you about a remedy or an answer. Right. To the problem. Right. They want to scare you to death. They want to uh, 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 you get you all into a frenzy and all paranoid and everything. But they never come to you with uh, 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 an answer or any kind of remedy for your problem and how to deal with this situation. Yeah, I, 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 this, what I am seeing is is that, um, you know, in this Western experience, a lot of things need to be clearly defined. You know, one of the things that I say is that the only true form of enlightenment, a.k.a. illumination, is the wisdom of love. Yes. So, you know, if you are illuminated, your orientation is love. Exactly. You know, what they're doing is people who have information, you could have you you could know that there are gods and goddesses living in every planet in the universe. Mm-hmm. You could know how to manipulate photons so that you can create an electron gun and shoot and hit a screen and create an image. You understand? You can know how to translate uh, audio and visual signals into electricity, into electrons into ones and zeros and these type of things. And you can call that enlightenment. You can know how to bring light, uh, how to make a filament run electricity and it gets to vibrate until it gets bright. But that's not what I call illumination, meaning there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. I put knowledge as information, meaning that you know things. But when you have wisdom... You know, is where they show you the heart being balanced against the feather, mm-hmm. meaning that that wisdom as the feather ma'at is equal to what's in your heart. That's why it balances. Right. And you know, they say what comes off the tongue is inside of the heart. So you know, when you have that guidance, when you have that wisdom. It is more so of, you know, a conscience. So Mm -hmm. you have like a moral compass, you know, of right and wrong. You know, um, I say, how dare you, how dare you deny people proper medical care and then you want to be Illuminati? You know, it's just, yeah, it's just an empty word, meaning that Illuminati does not deny people proper medical care. No, they do not. They and they don't them. broadcast perversion to seduce the human heart, mind, and soul. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't broadcast this type of corruption. Which, no. Which, yeah, just... The mere broadcasting of this type of Im- of this type of imagery it normalizes it, it desensitizes people to it. You know, um, I I you know walked into a conversation last night where a sister she says she said you know back back in our na- back in our nations you couldn't pr- you couldn't you couldn't print write and produce anything that wasn't authorized by, you know, the elders and, you know, the queen mothers and, you know, the uh, priests and priestesses or whatnot. Because that is where it would be filtered for public distribution. Right. But, you know, in the Western world, they say everybody's free. You know, you have the right to express your opinion. But if your opinion is inspiring people to rape, murder, pillage, uh, poison other people, then what rights can you have if rights are not based on morality? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But exactly. you see, yeah, you see how how much pe- people buy into this idea of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, without a balance of what you are expressing. 
and right. and you know I can never forget when members of these popular black churches, I think it's Reverend Calvin Butts up in Harlem, when they started to ask these you know rap artists to be accountable for their lyrics, and they were putting these people under a lot a lot of pressure, whereby they would have to come and give these public statements, you know one. Many of these people would say things like, I'm not a role model. I'm not a leader. You are. Yeah. The fact that so many people are seeing you as an individual, that makes you a leader and that makes you a role model. Yeah. But, you know, no one ever said this. They would, they, what they do is, is that they set up the arena and the context for the discourse. You know, no one comes and says, by default status, if hundreds of thousands or millions of people are watching you act in a certain way, you are modeling a role. You are modeling a role. That makes you a role model. Mm-hmm. Yes, they, when so, they say they're not a leader, they say that they don't want the responsibility of what they're saying in their lyrics. It's right. Their, uh, yeah. Yeah, but but you are responsible for what you say. Mm-hmm. Every single thing you do is recorded, and you do get judged. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of burst some people's bubble, but karma is real. Everything you do is recorded, and the judgment is a mathematical one. Nobody is a hundred percent good. You have to get a passing grade. Right. So what's your passing grade? Is it 75%? Is it 85%? And you have to be at least 80. I'm sticking to the number 80 and 8 and the octoward. 80 is, that's the passing mark. Anything under that is a failure when it comes to, okay, this person is good. 85%, 90, 95%. Now you get into genius class, okay? All all the people that are 90% good, these are the geniuses. The people that are 80% good, they are on their way. The people that are below 80, they need serious work. Yeah. The people that are below 65, they need to be put into a detox program, heavy-duty detox. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, 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 I mean, at some point, you you have to start to calculate so that you can telegraph, you know, how you're going to manage this thing. Because now, when you look at the lyrics of these artists, it's not eighty percent good. It's not ninety percent good. It's not ninety five percent good. It might be fifteen percent good, and it's now eighty five percent perversion. Mm-hmm. The, then you are accurate in saying, well, you know, what this person is doing is evil. It is immoral and it is wrong. Right. And that person should not be excused from being accountable. If you're going to excuse a person from being accountable for their moral status in civilization, then you are creating a despotism. You are encouraging one and you're funding and you're financing it. So, you know, um, <laughs> ho- hopefully we will see things getting better, but, you know, things will be get- getting better. Yeah. Right. Um, this, Brother Babanu, let's go to the phone lines, too. And there was a question that was asked in the chat room. Um, God, is Queen want to ask the question about what is the definition of love, and she want to hear more about Sagmat and the feminine energy of Kemet. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I wrote a book called Love is the Law of Life. Uh, love, love is a mathematical uh, calculation of behavior that underpins morality through the way that you are accountable to the agreements and the contracts that you enter in with people and your environment, let's say. That's what love is as as an ideological mathematical construct. And you can't have love without that. Meaning feelings, um, those are like 
um, you know, drive, that that is what makes you move and do. But what you do when you move, that's where love comes in, how you behave. So now love now is the expression of moral behavior, and you cannot be moral without being lawful, your accountability, what you say or what you are about. So now you 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 yourself, you have to be careful of getting into things that you cannot uh, provide. Mm. So it takes a self-reflection, meaning that there are there is love on levels. You know, when when we're talking about the actions of people who have the power and resources to distribute a better life, you, you know, uh, they're held up to a higher standard. When you have a people at the bottom, they they're not held to as high a standard, but you still look at certain markers to see whether or not you know these people have even the spark of love, which is lawfulness. Um, you know the goddess Sekhmet. Uh, you could not be a pharaoh in ancient Kemet if you were not married to the goddess Sekhmet. Uh, you have no power in Kemet, power to rule, authority to rule, if you were not working with the goddess Sekhmet. Uh, Sekhmet was the primary healer, he healer of the ancient Kemet people. Uh, Sekhmet performs what people call the destruction of the ego. If you study the 12 hours of the night uh, journey, there is a part in that journey where the pa is chopped in into pieces. Now, if if you have a powerful shekum or second division of your spirit, which I call your bio anatomy, you know, it's a part of you. When you take these uh, herbs, that part of you comes to the foreground and it seeks to chop up, eat, and devour your ka. When that happens, you experience a true rebirth. So, you know, your ka, it will get dirty, which is why they call the herb ayahuasca. It washes the ka, meaning the word wash or was. When you are healthy and strong, they say you are was. So, you know, ayahuasca washes the ka. It cleans and purifies and pulls it out of your system, and it is rebirth. It regenerates. You know, like your liver regenerates, so does your car. And so, you know, in the temples of Sekhmet, where they performed these uh, ritual rites or these healings in, in these clinics, this is what happens. I call it microsurgery of the soul. Sometimes you take one of these herbs and you can feel or see the uh, crystal blades actually chopping into your car. This is the wisdom of the goddess segment because people should not have power if they're sick. If you give sick people power, you're going to have sickness on an immense scale, exactly. like what we see in the Western world. Mm. Um, definitely appreciate that, Brother Bob. And now, um, let's go back. Let's go to the phone lines. We have area code 832. Area code 832, you're on the air. Area code 832, you're on the air. All right, let's go to the international. All right, let's go to the international line. We got area code 111, area code 111. Hi, Baba New, it's nice to hear your voice. Again, it's been Thank a long you. time. Oh, you're welcome. I, I'm the one that posed the question about segment and, and love and, and myrrh, and you gave a very um, potent answer. So with that, I just say um, to our enter, and I'm, I'm grateful that you are back on my screen anyway. <laughs> you're welcome, sis. And it's good to hear from you. I can remember your voice. It's always pleasant, calm, and beautiful. Uh, to our into beloved. To to our into nana.
All right. Um, for those who want to call in, area code number 626, number 414-3535. That's 626-414-3535. Give us a call um, in order to speak with Brother Babanu. Um, the brother is a hagan, which basically deals with the fact that he's a high priest. Um, so please call in um, if you have any questions. You've been listening for the last hour and a half. Definitely give us a call. Um, we're going to dedicate the last 20 minutes to um, the telephone line. So, therefore, give us a call at 626-414-3535. Well, until we get a caller, you know, i like to say, you know, for people out there listening in, um, you know, if if you want to get a copy of the books that I have written, you can get them on Amazon.com. And the books are called The God, Dreams, Decoded, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. And what I seek to do, you know, uh, outside of what I was discussing in the early part of the show as the foundations of Western civilization, is through this body of work that I get into what underpins the science and the culture because we are in a very, very a huge battle for our self-respect, as a people, how we feel about our people. So in the first book, I go over astrophysics and quantum theory, the hydrogen fusion cycle, and I break that down, and I relate it to the cosmological doctrines of the ancient Kimau, and I prove it. I show that they understood what the hydrogen atom is, and I showed that uh, they also was very, very clear about the theory of evolution of consciousness um, because, you know, a lot of us gravitate to the idea of being conscious and evolving our consciousness and these type of things. So I really, really clarify those things uh, through my work. Uh, you know, at this stage, I see that uh, looking at civilization, you know, and um, what what people as having culture, you know, uh, the arts, theater, fashion, music, uh, you know, outdoors activities, sports, you know, we are a people, we are people of this culture, you know, um, if, if you see a black person in an orchestra on TV or you go to the theater, you know, they're not imitating white people's culture. They might think that, but that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. They are continuing in the legacy of their ancestry. That's right. what they are, are doing. Uh, the same thing with science, because we have some geniuses that make Einstein look like the fool that he was. You know, exactly. Einstein was not an intelligent person. Einstein was a mentally retarded person that they promoted and propagated as a genius. Fixing the speed of light is stupidity. You understand? If yeah. you fix the speed of light, you fix the mode of transportation. Then you have to say stupid things like as you approach the speed of light, you need more fuel, which gets heavier. So, I mean, this is all garbage. If you know about a vacuum speed and inertia and friction and these type of things, this is the way that ships travel through the universe. They call it a black hole, but it's creating a vacuum. Once you push, you don't need to continue pushing because there's no friction pushing against you. So you don't need more fuel. You understand? And the speed that you can reach is infinite. You cannot calculate how fast you can go inside of a vacuum. What you need to get that thrust and speed is your ability to design something that can give you that thrust and speed. So this changes the need for even certain aerodynamics in motion because you don't have friction. Now, if you understand gyroscopic technology, you can see how a spacecraft can make a 90-degree turn and the people inside don't break their necks. Mm. 
So one of the things that my chef started doing with me is showing me exactly how the planets move around each, each other and how uh, ships that travel to different planets generate and control mo- movement in a very, very straight, linear, or curved fashion. So, you know, we we got to move forward in the dispensation of the knowledge that our ancestors had. We have to continue the movement yeah. because this 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 is a movement. You know, this has a purpose. The purpose of this movement is to restore people's pride. Because if a people don't have pride and courage in themselves and who they are, then it's very unlikely that they will achieve greatness again until they right. have that pride. That's right. You see, um, Brother um, Bob Manu, um yes. one of the things that I'm noticing is that um, the morality factor um, in spirituality is being demised. Um, let's talk on that for for a second there. Um, um, what's, what's your thoughts? Let's let's go into that a little bit more. Well, um, you know, because you know this this conversation, as I said, I walked into last night, and you know, I said, you know, at least back in the days of people like Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, there were higher mm-hmm. standards of uh, you know leadership. You know, at the very least. You know, like 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 yourself. You know, I I want to say speci- I want to say specifically why I reached out to you specifically because there are other people that want me to come on the blog talk radio shows, but I I reached out to you because I know you and I see the type of standards that you try to uphold. A lot of people aren't trying to uphold those standards. You know. Um, if you want to preach and teach and stuff like that, you should author a book. It's the type of exercise that you can give to your brain that is going to help you to be able to produce a higher moral output because it's your brain where you find the crown chakras, and it's the crown chakras that manage your behavior and stuff like that. It's in the crown chakras of the brain that you find a lot of the higher aggressive moral principles, meaning that your crown chakras, as you're – as you as you go up the chakra system, uh, the compromise with immorality gets lower and lower and lower. You know, um, I I think it's in my third book I I start getting into the chakras and the deities that are related to these chakras. So, you know, when you find that a person, uh, they want to make sure that it, that they author. You know, as you know, an academic, so that they could even uh, what you you might say deserve a, a title of doctorate. You know, so those things are getting less and less. So you know, the person was talking about you know like people who blog. You know, and she said you know there was a time when you didn't do these things unless you had some type of uh, uh, what you call it. You needed authority from the elders. You needed their ashe. You needed them to say, yes, you can go ahead and do this. So with with the coming of the information age and social media, it has given more unqualified and therefore people of lower moral capacity the opportunity to broadcast what they feel is right and wrong. You know, when you uh, got the whole, you know, core of the movement through people like, you know, Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and these type of guys. And I gave her, you know, uh, I said this is when it happened. When Mary Lefkowitz came out with the book Not Out of Africa, right. uh, that was that was the attack. And the attack went like this because they walked into the trap. If you want to preach and teach in our universities, don't insult our people like this. You know, don't exactly. push the hate like this. Don't belittle the people like this. So you have right. to be very, very careful when you're even given a, an an examination of you know Europe and Caucasian culture and these type types of things. You know, me. You know, uh, you know, as a Moor. 
and, you know, I know that some dark-skinned people don't like this, I have no problem with integrating ra- racially with any race on, on the planet. My my thing is what, how, who are you, not what's the color of your skin. Exactly. Meaning that, you know, when it comes to relationship and marriage and all that stuff, it's not about the color of your skin or your eyes or the texture. You know, those are things for the inferior man to look at. The superior man and woman looks at the content of a person's character and how they deal with other people, not at the color of their skin. So what developed in Afrocentrism, they were pushing too much disdain and hatred of Caucasian people, which is not the purpose. It's right. okay to give a critique, but when you're, you know, uttering things like the white devil, the white devil, yeah, you know, like... Uh, yeah, like they don't have black devils and, you know, Chinese devils and, like, you know, a devil or a person who's a bad person is not racially specific. Yes, we should show why why we were known as such people of high moral output. There's a reason. There's a reason. And it should be promoted because regardless of your race, you need help. You need help. You know, you live in, in America. You could be Caucasian. You could be Asian. You know, you live in a Europe. You're not living in the best that human pe- people can achieve. Right. This is not anything close to the best that we can achieve as a species on the planet. So it becomes very, very important that you give a very good critique and analysis of what's wrong. You know, outside of that, you see that when the Moors rule, uh, Islam and Judaism and Christianity can be in harmony in the nation. People of different racial types can be part of that nation, and we get all interbreed and become one family. But it's the, it is the 50th hexagram, the superstructure of the civilization that's important. You know, this is what allows people who are um, later on the scene of evolution to participate in a culture that brings them up the evolutionary ladder. And every single human being on the planet deserves that right. Yes. No doubt. Yes, you look like that you spent too much time and. Uh, calling uh, Europeans, uh, white people, uh, whatever you want to call them, devils. And uh, it's very counterproductive uh, because you've not given yourself time to grow and study and and who you are. Who who are you, you know? And uh, like you said, uh, uh, it's uh, not about who uh, intermarrying with who, you know, so much. Uh, it's about who or you are first. Can you right. deal with your first self first? Can you deal with who you are first? Before you talk about dealing with someone else outside of your race or nationality or culture, you know. Right, right. You know, um, I, I often wonder. You know, meaning for me, I see it as a sign of progression when people of you know when a Caucasian person can be with a black person because of the history of the conflict between those two people. But then I ask myself, what type of culture do they have and what type of culture are they going to give to the offspring? Exactly. You know, that's what is important. And I don't see a large enough number of people in the Western world getting a culture that can really take humanity to the stars where they belong. No, because it's not the nature of the Western people. Right. You know, and Western people are people who participate in Western culture, (laughs) you know, Um, not not people that are racially specific. If you participate, if you have totally bought into Western culture framework and stuff like that, you are a Western person. Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. you could call yourself African or African American. You could call yourself Muslim, Christian, Jew, or more. You could, you could. All these labels, you know, are 
you know, I guess cool to, you know, give your mind some type of structure which mm-hmm. underpins your security about yourself. But now, you know, when you get into your day to day life, the things that you aspire to ascribe to the practices that you get into to maintain mental balance and homeostasis, you know, that's your culture. Yeah. You know, so you know, uh, we find that a lot of people are getting into debates over right and wrong. When I find that, you know, a person just, you know, can't get it, I, you know, I go, well, you know, what's your culture? You know, mm-hmm. what what is your culture? Mm-hmm. You know, because uh, that that is going to supersede your idea of, you know, a lot of the things that you are using to, Ferment and participate in discord. What is your culture? You know, what are your ideals? You know, what is mm-hmm. in your heart? You know, what do you want? Mm-hmm. And when you, when a person can really be very clear with what they want, because that is your mission statement, and then that uh, uh, that underpins the bylaws and the social contract of your soul. Yeah. This uh uh like I I I say I I'm a more, but the, uh, that's uh why well, I don't consider a label. I consider it as who I am. Uh, right. That's being connected to the land of the earth. As the first the original people of the earth, the Aboriginal Indigenous people of the earth. Uh, that's what I. That's who I am. Uh, uh, that's my blood. Uh, that's my blood right. Birthright. Whether I, whether I consider myself as a Moor or not, you know, I, I, right. or deny it or not, that's, that's who I am, and uh, uh, no one can take that away from me, you know, and that's how right. I know, that's how I, I deal with it. Yeah, you know, I I knew that I was a Moor at age eighteen, but I didn't really know what a more was in the sense of what I see a lot of people, you know, meaning that, you know, when I wanted to speak to my ancestors, you know, they all came and visited me in, you know, purple, uh, purple regal robes and purple fezzes, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, at, 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 at that time at age 18, you know, no one had told me, you know, that, you know, oh, that's, that, that's what Moors, you know, wear. And they were very, very clear. They said, you know, we are from the Congo, and we moved up into Nubia. You know, so they were trying to go back as ancient as possible that was relevant to a framework of human history that I can understand. And, yes, you know, so, you know, when it got initiated into voodoo, it's clear that I am Congo, you know. And, you know, so I see the people, we are the Congo Moors. You know, that's my lineage. That is my ancestry, and yeah. this is how the Loa, you know, uh, and the Neteru, you know, because not that Loa, Neteru, and Orishas are not the same, but, you know, uh, in my practice, you know, those are words that I use, you know, so when I connect with certain deities, they greet me as a Moor. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, I, I am very proud because... I had to find out what what that means, you know what what is special about being a Moor, what is good about being a Moor, mm-hmm. why 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 is that something of relevance to even gods and goddesses? And exactly. I was yeah I was glad to go on that journey, and to find that out and to appreciate it. So it is something that's very important to my ancestral lineage and history. Right. Beautiful. All right, right Brother thank Bobby. Thank you very much. Yeah. Brother Bobby, yeah. we have four more yeah. minutes left. Um, any closing remarks, anything that you want to go over for the audience before um, we go? Um, no, you know, I think that we did a really, 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 really good job. Uh, you know, yeah. if people need to, you know, get an understanding of you know where my heart is, you can get that better through my writing, and you can get my books on uh, Amazon.com. Title search: The God Genes Decoded. 
And um, you know, right. in yeah, in the book, there's my contact information. It is in the book if you want to reach out to me, um, because I do practice as a priest. You know, I try not to do services for people too much because we are living in very uh, unhealthy environment. And, you know, you want to make sure that you don't bite off more than you can chew. <laughs> All right. That's right. That's right. Well, we appreciate you coming on again, Brother Babanu. And uh, we're going to have you back on again as soon as possible. So please stay in contact with me. And um, tell me the next time that you are available to come back on. And, um, right. Brother L, you have any closing remarks? Yes, I'll be pleased, very pleased to have you on back on the air soon, Brother. Uh, Thank you very talking much. Talking with you, uh, uh, dropping science with you and everything. I, I, didn't, I didn't really plan on this today. You know, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was planning on going somewhere, but what the uh, Dr. Eileen's queen called me, you know, I said, oh, yeah, well, I can stay here then. And, you know, <laughs> science up with these boys, you know, these brothers, you know. All well, right. Well, we appreciate you staying along with us, Brother L. No doubt about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Aline Bear and Brother L, we will be staying in touch. I'm going to reach out to you as soon as I can because um, this has been a long time coming. Uh, you know, in, in the past, back when I was on MySpace and you had reached out to me, you know, I was really, really still getting my orientation. So, um, right. you know, looking forward to the future. Oh, yeah, no doubt, brother. Appreciate you. And I'm definitely, you, you took all the way back to MySpace days. I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! All right. Going, going back to the days of Doctor Ben too. That's right. All right. All right. Peace and out, y'all. Peace and love. Right. Peace, Peace and love. First World Order Radio. Finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that Buddha consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance, the most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance, the most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know how intention is straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works.